Well, <clears throat> our text this morning is a relatively short passage in Romans 6, verses 1 and 2, where I believe Paul is addressing this very deception of the enemy. Okay? He writes this, What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Now, what we have here, really, the, the two things we're looking at this morning, and that is, first of all, that um, the enemy will use God's grace as an excuse to sin, which is apparently how some were taking it, which is why Paul wrote what he did. Should we continue in sin? Because if, as we do sin and God forgives us, it gives him the opportunity to glorify and magnify his grace. If, if he's glorified by forgiving us, shouldn't we sin more so he can bring more glory to his uh, grace and mercy? He says, may it never be. Don't even begin to think along those lines. Rather, we should see his mercy as a reason not to sin. We, we died to sin by his grace and mercy with Christ and have been raised to newness of life. But, you know, nevertheless, the enemy will still use this, and we need to know that, and we need to know how to uh, repel him when he comes. Now, uh, we have been seeing that, again, there is a very real spiritual being, an enemy of God, and our enemy who wants us to fall. And don't be deceived. Satan hates us, okay? He wants to destroy us. He would love to have us share eternity with him in hell. But he knows he can't destroy us, and since he can't, he'll do the next best thing. He'll try to put as much distance between us and God as possible, that he might weaken our love for him, and so our ability to serve him effectively. Now, we know in Scripture that God warns us about sin. He warns us about breaking the commandments, and we need to understand why he does that. It's not just because it dishonors him, though that is a part of it. God is holy, and he would have us also to be holy. Those who would dwell with him must be like him. But he also forbids it because of the way it hurts us. And we know that when we sin, it, it does offend the Holy Spirit. Remember, we are the temples of the Holy Spirit. He dwells in us. He is, we might say, pleased, the Spirit, when we do what is right, but He is offended when we do what is wrong. It, it does grieve Him, and we know it quenches His work. He withdraws, and as the Spirit of God withdraws, it cools our love. It really does make a difference in how we view the kingdom of heaven, how we view the Bible, how we view the things God calls us to do. The more we have of the Holy Spirit, the more we want to do of these things, the less we have of the Spirit, the more, or I should say, the less we want to do that, and the more we want to focus on the world. Why is it that sometimes our affections are drawn into the world rather than into the things of the Lord? It's because of how much of the influence of the Spirit of God we have. The devil wants to weaken that influence, he wants us to sin so that he might weaken that work of the Spirit. Now, we've seen that he mainly does this through deception. The devil, again, is trying to get us to look at things the wrong way. And we know he has many ways to do this, and this, I think, is probably number five we're looking at now. And, but I think, you know, we want to look at about 12 of them, but we need to realize there's probably almost an innumerable, you know, number. Well, we've seen that he likes, you know, he, he makes sin look fun. He makes it look pleasurable uh, rather than, of course, uh, letting us see the results of it, which is it will ultimately make us miserable. He makes sin look good. He makes it look like a virtue rather than a vice. But again, as we, as we get involved in it, we find it's not a virtue. Again, it is grieved and quenched the Spirit of God. And again, we feel miserable. Or maybe he'll make it look trivial. You know, God doesn't really care whether you do that or not. Uh, but again, as he trips us and makes us fall, we find out it's not really quite so trivial. Or he reminds us that it's normal for a Christian to sin. After all, David did it, Peter did it, uh, Hezekiah. We have many examples in Scripture, Noah. 
And yet they came out okay. You know, even the best saints fall from time to time, and we're not the best, and so how much more will we fall into sin? And as I said, at the same time, he will hide the consequences, what it will really cost us in the end, so he can get us to fall into sin. Now this morning, let's look at another one of his deceptions, and that is he tries to get us to use God's love, his mercy, his forgiveness, as an excuse to sin. And what he will do is he will argue something like this, okay, you, you really don't need to take sin so seriously because God is a God of mercy. God delights in mercy. He never gets tired of showing mercy, again, as we've seen, because he's glorified when he shows mercy and grace to those who fall into sin. Uh, he'll go on to, to give us arguments from Scripture. For instance, when Peter asked Jesus, as we read in Matthew 18, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 70 times seven. Well, Satan will tell us, look, if God requires you to be so forgiving towards others, how much more, since he is infinitely gracious, how much more will he pardon you? You don't need to worry. God is merciful. Now, Brooks, uh, Thomas Brooks, again, we're trying to learn from Brooks from his uh, classic work, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices, believes that this is perhaps his most effective lie and the one he uses more often than any other. And it shows us just how subtle Satan can be because on the one hand, he's extolling God's mercy, isn't he? He's showing us how, how great the mercy of God is. God is a God of infinite mercy. Remember when Moses prayed that God might show him his glory on that mountain, as I mentioned earlier in our meditation. Um, he was renewing the covenant with the Lord, or I should say the Lord was renewing it with his people because they had just sinned against him with the golden calf, and Moses had shattered the tablets as uh, just a visual illustration that they had broken the covenant. And so it's being renewed, and he prays that God would reveal his glory to him. And we read this in Exodus 34. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin. This is God's revelation of his glory. God glorifies his grace and his mercy through his forgiveness, and that's why he delights so much in showing it. And you see, Satan loves to capitalize on that very thing. And he says if God desires his, to glorify himself by showing mercy, then you should give God more opportunities to do that. Okay? You should just simply sin and not worry so much about it because in the end, God's going to be glorified. But that's exactly what Paul is addressing in our passage. What should we say then? Should we continue in sin so the grace may increase? Okay? There are those who use God's mercy as an excuse for sin rather than, as they should, a reason not to. Now, Brooks is going to teach us how to defend ourselves against this, and as he does, he's going to show us the reasons why God chose his mercy in the first place, which is just the opposite of how Satan wants to use it. He says, first of all, we need to remember that it's because of God's mercy that he has broken the power of sin in our hearts, it's because of his mercy we no longer have to sin. Now, Augustine once wrote that it's human to sin. It's devilish to continue in sin, but angelic to rise from it. Now, we know, sadly, as believers, we, we still sin. Remember how Solomon, when he's dedicating the temple and he's praying to the Lord, he inserts parenthetically, there is no man who does not sin. He says, you know, when, when your people sin and they look toward this place and they pray, forgive them, and as he's praying again, reminding them that this is a part of human nature. We all sin every day. I know some people don't like to hear that, but as a matter of fact, it's true. 
There is no one who does not sin, and that's true every day. We sin in our words and thoughts and in our actions. And if you're wondering how that could be true, well, just simply ask yourself this question right now. Do you love the Lord with all your heart and mind and soul and strength? Have you ever done that even for a moment of your life? None of us have, you see, if we're going to be honest with ourselves. And how many of us have loved our neighbor as we love ourselves? Well, again, as Augustine wrote, it's human to sin because we are still very imperfect. But Brooks reminds us that even when we do sin, remember, because of the grace of God within us, we never do it with our whole heart, but with only half a heart, because the power of sin has been broken. And as Augustine just reminded us, we don't continue in it. We repent and we rise from it. Not to do so is devilish, he says. We repent because God has given to us his Holy Spirit. Because we love him. Because we don't want to sin. Because we want to do as honoring to him. And this is how we know that we have received the mercy of God, that we no longer want to sin with a whole heart because the power of sin has been broken. So Brooks is asking us, first of all, this question. If God's mercy is what sets us free from sin, how can we now use his mercy as an excuse to sin? Okay, we can't. That, again, he'll remind us that's the devil's logic, okay? God's mercy has broken the power of sin. It doesn't give us an excuse to sin. Now, secondly, he says, it's because of his mercy that we have been delivered from his judgment. Now, Brooks reminds us that, yes, God is a God of mercy, but God is also a God of justice. And God takes sin as seriously as he does his mercy. And he points out several examples of this. Peter writes in 2 Peter 2, verse 4, God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Moses tells us that when Adam and Eve sinned, God cast them out of paradise. He tells us that it was because of the, of the sins of mankind that he drowned an entire world of people in the flood, except for Noah and his family. And Paul tells us that God is still in the business, in Romans 1.18, of pouring out his wrath on the ungodly every day for their sins. Now, he says we need to remember that that is what we deserve. And it's only because of God's mercy that we will not be judged along with the world for our sins. And so having been delivered from judgment by his mercy... Should we now use his mercy as an excuse to sin? Well, again, that's the devil's logic. But we need to make sure we see things the way the Lord calls us to see them. Now, third, Brooks tells us to consider that sins committed against greater mercy are liable to greater judgments. He writes, when mercy is despised, then justice takes the throne. Now here let me just mention that um, Brooks is aware, as everyone should be, every minister should be, and particularly in his day when I believe everyone was required by law to be in a church on the Lord's Day. He realized, as Jonathan Edwards did in New England, because the situation was the same, if you have the entire community in your church, guess what? You're going to have unbelievers who are present. And he wanted to remind them that if, if you believe that God has saved you, if he has been gracious to you, and in the light of that grace, you continue to sin, all you're doing is opening yourself up to greater judgment. And that would be the case with anyone who continues to use God's mercy as an excuse for sin. So let me develop this. Remember what Jesus said to Capernaum. He says in Matthew 11, verses 23 through 24, and you, Capernaum, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? You shall descend to Hades. For if the miracles had occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom 
in the day of judgment than for you. Now, if you did not, if you didn't know that Jesus had said that, but you were aware of Capernaum and what it was like when Jesus was living there, and you were aware of what happened in Sodom with regard to the, you know, the sins of the Sodomites and so forth and how God rained fire and brimstone upon them, and somebody asked you, which of the two would deserve greater judgment? You know, what, what would you have said? Okay. Uh, I think we would probably all answer in the same way that Capernaum will in the day of judgment. And that is, Sodom deserves worse than we do. But Jesus told Capernaum, no, you deserve the greater judgment. And why is that? Well, because of the greater light that they received. Remember, Jesus lived in Capernaum, didn't he? Capernaum wasn't that big, you know. There weren't that many people there. But Jesus preached in the streets. Jesus did miracles there. They heard and they saw the Son of God giving irrefutable evidence that he was who he claimed to be and that his gospel was true, and yet they rejected him. And so Jesus says they are much more culpable than Sodom. What Brooks is arguing here is if that is what they deserved for rejecting Jesus Christ, how much greater judgment do those deserve who have experienced even more of God's grace, even more of the work of the Holy Spirit, but who fall short of that grace by using his grace as an excuse for sin, which if they continue to do, they show themselves not to be converted at all. Now, what he has in mind here, I believe, is what the author to the Hebrews argues in that very difficult passage in Hebrews chapter 6. You know, we read that and we're trying to make sense of it sometimes. You know, is, it, is he talking about a believer? Is he talking about an unbeliever? Well, he's obviously talking about an unbeliever. But he talks about the privileges that these unbelievers had and the light that they sin against and the seriousness of the judgment against it. And of course, it's a warning not to use the grace of God to um, excuse your sin. Listen to what he says in Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 9. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance, since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Now again, I believe he's referring to unbelievers here. Let me go on to argue it from what follows. He says this, For the ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it, and brings forth vegetation useful for those um, whose sake it is also tilled, receives a blessing from God. That is, you know, again, the, the watering of the Holy Spirit, of the means of grace. They, they're under this abundant shower, so to speak, and the ground receives it, and it brings forth vegetation. What does that remind you of? But the parable of the sower, right? The Lord sows the seed, and the good soil brings forth some 30, 60, 100 fold. Those are the true believers, okay? So some of them are producing fruit. But then he goes on to say this, but if it yields thorns and thistles, it is worthless and close to being cursed, and it ends up being burned. Okay, this is the other group of people who receive these same blessings, so to speak, but yet their lives don't bring forth any fruit. Again, think of the parable of the sower, one of the... Well, actually, two, actually three of the soils, right? I mean, it doesn't penetrate. Uh, it springs up, it withers away, but then others bring thorns and thistles, and it doesn't bring any fruit to maturity. This, these are those who are worthless, close to being cursed, ends up being burned. Remember what Jesus said, every branch in him that does not bear fruit is cut off and cast into the fire. Okay? So he's clearly here talking about unbelievers, when he's talking about those who have received all of these particular blessings of the Holy Spirit and of the church and these sanctifying effects, but haven't brought any fruit to maturity, they are the ones who are still using the grace of God as an excuse to sin because what he's referring to here are those people who are turning away from Christianity and going back to Judaism because of the persecution of the Romans. But then here's one last thing he says. But beloved... 
Those who are still there, those who haven't abandoned the church and the faith and gone back to Judaism, but beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. Remember, Paul started off by saying, those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of them the gift, those, these are the ones who have rejected it and have fallen away, but you, beloved, were convinced of better things concerning you. You see, he's talking here about those, again, who are using God's grace as an excuse for sin. They've received all of these blessings and they've sinned against this greater light. And so Brooks is warning us, if we have received those things and we continue to use God's mercy and grace as an excuse for our sins, we're just making things worse for ourselves. Our condition will be worse in the end than if we had never known the Lord. Brooks concludes this point by saying this, no souls fall so low into hell, if they fall, as those souls that by a hand of mercy are lifted up nearest to heaven. How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Oh, therefore, whenever Satan shall present God to the soul as one made up of all mercy, that he may draw you to do wickedly, say to him that sins against mercy will bring upon the soul the greatest misery, and therefore whatever becomes of you, you will not sin against mercy. The greater the privileges we sin against, the greater the offense to God, and the greater the judgment. If we should turn out not to be believers, but even if we are believers, it's still offensive to him. Now, fourthly, Brooks reminds us uh, of what's true of every saint who has received God's mercy, and that is that they don't practice sin, but they do love and obey him. Now, he said, he, he writes as an illustration, he says, it was, it was said that Caesar Augustus, in his solemn feasts, would give small things to some, but gold to others whom his heart was most set upon. So it is with God. In his goodness, he gives some outward blessings to all men, but he reserves his gold, his special mercy, for those whom he loves. Now, to put this in more familiar terms, God is good, you know, he's, he's kind to ungrateful and evil men. He gives the sun and the rain to all mankind. We call that his common goodness. Those are the small things he gives out of his goodness. But God has a special saving goodness, grace, the gold that he gives to his elect, those whom he's loved and chosen from all eternity. And what is that gold? That gold is the spirit to work the virtues of Christ within us. So how can we know if we are those whom the Lord loves? How can we know if we are those whom the Lord has shown mercy? Well, we've received the gold, okay? We have the Spirit to move us to love and obey Him. Remember what John writes in 1 John 2, verses 4 through 6. The one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps His word, in Him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So how can we know we receive the mercy of God? Well, very simply, we live the way that Jesus lived. Okay? We begin to exhibit his character. Uh, the Spirit of God is working Christ's likeness within us. So again, should, is, is mercy an excuse to sin? No, if we have mercy... We, we have the power to love and obey him. And finally, he reminds us, that is, the devil will remind us, no, excuse me, Brooks will remind us, that the greatest saints who have ever lived never use God's mercy as a reason to sin, but really their strongest argument against sin. And we have several examples in Scripture. Here's a couple. David writes in Psalm 26, verses 3 through 5, For your loving kindness is before my eyes, and I have walked in your truth. 
I do not sit with deceitful men, nor will I go with pretenders. I hate the assembly of evildoers. I will not sit with the wicked. Why? Again, because God's loving kindness and his mercies, his covenant mercies are before his eyes. His mercies are the reasons why he won't sin. He also points to Joseph. When Joseph was um, tempted by Potiphar's wife as she was urging him to lie with her, he considered the Lord's mercies. I imagine he considered some other things as well. And he wrote this, how then, or he said this, how then can I do this great evil and sin against God? I can't. God hates this. And God has been gracious and merciful to me, even though he's gone through some pretty difficult times. Remember, this is not somebody who's had an easy life. He's just now, um, actually, he's about to go into prison, but he's been hated, thrown into the pit, sold to some slave traders, sold into Egypt, bought by Potiphar, and now he's facing this temptation, and he still clings to God because God is a God of great mercy. And then, of course, Paul writes in our text, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. That's the strongest possible way in the, in the Greek language to deny something. Paul says, by God's mercy and grace, we have died to sin. How can we still live in sin? So Brooks concludes his entire argument in this way. He says, there is nothing in the world that renders a man more unlike to a saint and more like to Satan than to argue from mercy to sinful liberty. This is the devil's logic. And so, in essence, what Brooks is saying is that when Satan encourages you to sin because God is merciful, because God will forgive you. Tell him this, that God in his mercy has broken the power of sin in your heart. That by his mercy, he has delivered you from the judgment you so justly deserved. That having received such great mercy, you will not offend the God you love by using his mercy as an excuse for sin. That by his mercy you now have the power to love and obey him and to put your sins to death and that because of his mercy, you will not side with the devil, but with the greatest saints who never used God's mercy as an excuse for their sin, but as the strongest possible reason not to sin. Well, may the Lord give us grace to receive this counsel from Brooks and to resist the devil when he comes to us. Let's, let's bow in a moment of prayer. And let's, um, as we pray, let's search our hearts to see if the devil has deceived us in this way. If we are using God's grace as an excuse for our sins, let's repent of that as we prepare to come to the table to receive God's grace and his mercy, um, again, by faith in, in the Lord Jesus.